Hey class, it's Bill here with an introductory video on Chapter 1, Computers and Programming. We're going to uh, not cover everything that's in the book. These videos can never cover all of that, but I want to touch on a few interesting subjects and kind of get you rolling in the chapter with a few hints and maybe some different perspectives than what you have in your book. Uh, here's some of the things we'll cover here. First, uh, we'll look a little bit at storing data. The book spends quite a few pages on binary, so we want to talk about what binary is, why we care about it, should we care about it. We'll also talk a little bit about syntax and keywords, give you some information about that, and then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about compilers and interpreters and what the differences are between them. If you have any questions about any of this, please ask in the forums or in email. First of all, as I said, the book talks a lot about binary, but why should we really learn about binary? Do we have to? <clears throat> First of all, it's just something that computer programmers know. Uh, if you ask any computer programmer what 2 to the 8th is or what any kind of power of 2 is, they're just going to know it. It just comes in handy from time to time. It's something that you just need to know, so, you know, sorry, you just need to kind of buckle down and know the thing. But here's a specific example. If you know how much storage you have, available to store information, you can calculate how many kinds of val how many distinct values you can store in that space. For instance, in one byte, eight bits of storage, if you take eight ones and put them together in binary, and then you convert that back to decimal, you'd find out that one 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 all these ones turn into two five five. That means that you can store values from 0 to 255 in that amount of space. That's 256 distinct values. Of course, a programmer knows that 2 to the 8th is 256. So this is just an example of where binary will come in handy. And knowing the powers of 2 up to a certain point at least, you know, at least 8, maybe 2 to the 16th, are going to be just useful for you. Now, how do you convert from decimal to binary and back? Well, the book talks a lot about it, so I don't think I can add more to their examples that's going to be useful to you. But one thing I do want to tell you is to check your work. You can use your programmer's your program uh, calculator that's provided with your operating system. If you have Windows like I do, uh, I have Windows 10, so my calculator looks a little different, you'll see that there is a programmer-style calculator. Let me bring this on the screen. You can switch between views from the standard view to the programmer view just using the little hamburger icon up here and once you're in the programmer calculator you're going to see that you have um, if you click on binary down here you'll see that only one and zero are available on the numbers which is makes sense for binary and if you type in binary numbers using your keyboard or click on them here and then you'll see that decimal equivalent is shown here and you can switch back and forth between modes by just clicking on those modes here. So it's nice and useful in checking your work and knowing what the equivalents are. You should know how to do this though yourself but this is a good way to check it and I just wanted to point out that you have that tool available to you. Some cool things about binary, well just like in base 10 decimal that we use all the time, if you want to multiply something by 10, you just shift it over one position, right? Same thing with binary with multiplying by 2. You want to multiply by 2, you just shift it over to the left one position and add a 0 on the far right. So there's an example here on the screen. Same thing dividing by 2, you just shift to the right one position. You want to multiply by 4, you shift to the left two positions. You want to multiply by 8, shift it three positions. So these are all some interesting implications about binary and working with these kinds of numbers. So it is worthwhile and it's something that you really ought to know how to, how to do and you'll come back to it from time to time in your programming experience. I want to talk also about syntax and keywords. Programming languages have specific syntax that you need to use. Languages, spoken languages, have syntax as well. It's not usually quite as rigorous, but they do have rules that you need to use. To oversimplify English, a very simple construction is if I take a noun and a verb and another noun, we generally understand this as a subject, verb, object construction. That's the syntax that we're using here. So, for instance, if I say to you, the boy throws the ball. You get a noun and a verb and a noun and you get a mental picture of the boy throwing the ball. That's an English construction that just works. You just understand it. Now let's do one that's a syntax error. If I say throws the boy the ball, 
that feels either incomplete or it feels wrong. It's the wrong order, it doesn't make sense to you, and you'd have to stop and ask, now wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Do you really mean this, or do you mean this other thing, or is this incomplete? So that's a syntax error in a programming language where you haven't used things in the syntactically specified order. There are also logic errors where perhaps you specify noun, verb, noun, but you use it in this way, the ball throws the boy. Well, it's syntactically correct, but this means a whole different thing. You're going to get a whole different result of a ball throwing a boy versus a boy throwing a ball. So these are just some quick, easy examples of syntax uh, that you might see here. But the important thing to know is computer languages don't tend to forgive this stuff very much. In human language, we can kind of understand if people are speaking broken English. Sometimes we can piece it together and get the general idea. But computer languages won't do any such figuring out. You really have to be very specific, and you'll see different kinds of errors when you, when you make syntax errors and logic errors during your programs. You need to test to find these, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. To cover uh, keywords specifically, programming languages have certain built-in words that they understand intrinsically, natively. And if you use these words, you don't have to explain them to Python. Python just understands, just, just like if you type the number 10, it knows it's the number 10. And if you use these words, it understands them natively. So examples would be if, and, while, true, not. So these are keywords that Python understands. Now, a good thing is when we use the IDLE to type, you'll see these things colored in a very specific way. So you'll notice in this example, if I type this into the IDLE, if age is greater than 20 and valid license equals true, colon. Now, you'll notice that if, and, and true are all color-coded, they're marked in orange in this case, so that you can know you type the keywords in. Now, this is a good thing because if you start typing one of those and it doesn't highlight, that means you haven't typed it correctly. Either the case is wrong or you've typed more or fewer letters than you needed to, so this is a hint to you uh, that it has understood you in these, these terms. Now, the other pieces that you see on this line, age and valid license, these are not keywords. These are something else, and those things mean something different. We'll get to that a little bit later. Another thing to note is if you go later to make up your own names for things, uh, you can't use those words as names. They are reserved and can only be used for the purpose that Python designs them for. So we have to work around them uh, when we make up our own names later. Again, we'll get to that in a later date. Let's talk briefly also about compilers and interpreters. Computer languages need to take something that is semi or completely human readable and turn it into something the machine can run. So it has to turn human type languages or human readable languages into binary machine language that it can actually execute. But it, they differ, these languages, in how they do this. First, you have compilers. A compiler will take an entire source program, like a CPP, that's C++, and convert the whole thing into binary. And then, when you want to run the program, you run the executable that the compiler spit out. So it's a kind of a two-step process. You do the compiling, that gives you an executable, and then you run the executable. Now, to share your programs, you can just share the executable. You can just share that machine executable piece. And then the source code never has to go to the end user. That's kind of convenient because if you have intellectual property, if you develop something really cool and unique, it's pretty hard to turn it from machine language back into something human readable, so your intellectual property is protected to some extent. Now, if you have, let's, let's jump down to interpreters, we'll come back to the second point. An interpreter takes a single line of code from the source program, like a Python file. You'll also hear these source codes, these programs talked about as scripts because they are interpreted. But it takes that single line, converts it to binary, and then executes that right, that right at that point. So it's a much shorter little cycle of line consumed and run. Now, What's the implication of this? Well, if you want to share your Python programs with somebody, you have to send them the Python code. You send them the source code. Then they have to run an interpreter on their end to turn the Python into machine language and run it. So they must have the interpreter on their end. 
Now let's go back and talk about the other implication that I mentioned here and that is how does a compiler when it gobbles up a whole program what's your experience of errors of syntax errors well since the compiler is doing this gobbling of this whole program at one time this whole source program if you have any syntax errors anywhere when it's doing the gobbling it's going to find them and report them so it's not uncommon when you compile a program to get tens of errors, 20, 30, 40, you can get hundreds of errors in a very complex program very easily. But it spits them all out and tells you about all of them. And so that's one of the implications uh, that all of those errors have been flushed out by the compile process. Not so with an interpreter. An interpreter, since it does it one line at a time, unless you get to that line and actually try to execute, try to, you know, try to interpret and execute it, you're not going to find the errors. So testing for syntax errors is going to be uh, kind of different. You have to go and look for them. You have to go and find the errors, get to those lines. So testing is very important in the interpreted world. So this is not an exhaustive introduction, but I wanted to just spend a few minutes kind of telling you my thoughts about some of these items, giving you a different idea, maybe than your author did. But that takes us to the end of this introduction to chapter one. Again, if you have questions, please post them in the forum uh, so other people can see them and respond. And if you have other questions that you don't want to share with the class, please send them to me in email at the college email address. Thanks for watching this video, and we will uh, talk to you online. Thanks for watching.